Hey, I'm Sweeney Chad, and today I'm trying to beat the Kerbal Space Program to four science update using only aircraft. And in this episode, things go a little bit off the rails. In the last episode, we used our strato launcher aircraft to launch a small probe into Kerbin orbit. In fact, far, far beyond Kerbin orbit. So I think we're more than deserving of those 75 science points. And as soon as we cash those in, we get the brand new Munner Bust mission, which grants us 150 science points. So the basic idea here is to take the exact same probe from last video and put like 100 different stages of Sepatrons on it. That'll kind of let us pick how much Delta V we want to use, rather than burning all of our fuel like last time. After just a few modifications, we're already back out on the runway, and you may have noticed that I actually got rid of the pilot and replaced it with a probe core. This is to stop any more lawsuits from Kerpenot families when their little green loved ones get slammed into the North Pole at Mach 1.5. But alas, we're about to light our engines and hopefully get on our way to Mun Orbit. And our little rocket is having absolutely no problems so far. Being able to get very easily into Kerbin Orbit with absolutely no problems. But now out of fuel, we're going to have to hand this over to our janky little Sputnik that's uh, got eyeballs. That was unintentional, but janky or not, that Sepatron stage clears our first stage in a hurry. Luckily, the next two Sepatron stages are much, much more toned down, especially that one. And uh, this next one is so slow and has so little fuel that I was completely unsure if it would actually get a Mon intercept. But after trying forever, it did actually get an intercept with the Mon just barely. So we warp out to the Mon into the Mon periapsis and burn one of our last two remaining Sepatron stages. Luckily, this completes our mission and we get those wonderful science points, but it doesn't quite put us into Mun orbit. In fact, it made us impact fun. So we burn our very last stage, hoping to get a Mun orbit, we we'll get a weird Kerbin orbit instead. But luckily, we do still get our 150 science points and several new missions to play around with. First off, we're going to do a very easy one called Going Green, and we're going to pull out our science plane from last video to do this. Now, we could have just uh, did this on the runway and then recovered our mission and been absolutely fine and got our science points, but we're going to go a little bit fancier and fly over to the island runway for a reattempt of that horrible landing from last episode, and we get our science on the way. And obviously, we have a perfectly smooth, buttery landing that's not hard whatsoever, and they'd absolutely not give Jebediah whiplash. I don't care what he says. And before you know it, we're right back in Mission Control, gathering our science and looking for a brand new mission to take on. And after a quick look at them, I think I can knock out two of these by simply just putting a Kerbal into orbit. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to beef up our original strato launcher from the last episode, add two more engines to it, and make our little rocket payload into a little Kerbal payload, and stick Jebediah in there, of course. So after switching rocket engines out, we're already out on the runways with our new and improved strato launcher 4 5, I can't remember which one this is, but we added two more engines to it and increased the wingspan even more. We've already increased the wingspan of this like twice, I think. But it flies like a charm, and it has no Kerbal in it to die, so it's absolutely perfect in my opinion. So we get up to some crazy speeds on those Weasleys and drop our new and improved Jebediah carrying Little Rocket Payload. That is the official name, I don't care if it's long. So it's able to get off in a hurry and get away from our plane, which unfortunately of course dies after 2.2 kilometers. If you do notice any differences in this and the final rocket that I showed in the build part of this, uh, that's because many simulation jebs died for this. And our little tiny little baby flea looking uh, top stage uh, finally pops off and goes on its merry way to orbit and uh, does it pretty darn well. This is a this is a pretty nice little system to just get into low curb and orbit. Not exactly the uh, fanciest thing ever, but it'll get you there. And we've got our wonderful science points and it's a lot of them too because we got two different missions on this one because we took jeb out on a little bitty spacewalk and before we know it, we're sending jeb right back to the surface we're using those little emergency sepatrons on the side those were there in case i ran out of fuel and couldn't get this pod back to the surface but now they're just going to serve as an extra safety for our baby boy jeb who touches down softly in the ocean back at mission control we cash in 100 science points then 40 science points, it's 140 science points for one mission, and then we're back in the R&D Center where we unlock Tier 2. We're checking out what Tier 2 has, which it has all the great airplane parts in Tier 2. This is going to be the place to be for us, and we're going to go ahead and pick up some monopropellant stuff because that's going to be the easiest small engines that we can get, but we don't have enough for the main monopropellant engine, so we're just going to build some kind of quick, weird, heli jet craft to try to get some extra science from around the KSC. This is a missionary thing, like I said, it's just going to be getting some extra science from around the KSC, and I think the best place to go is over here at the beach, which is extremely spiky. I do not know why my game looks like this, but it has since launch. We do a quick barrel roll and a flawless 
flawless landing. Trust me, I'll land this thing absolutely beautifully. It, it just lands so pretty in those uh, beach spikes. And we get Jeb out to gather some sides, I guess. I mean, he gets some sand in a test tube. I should have read the science report on this. I bet it would have been pretty funny. So that's just enough to get us our beautiful model propeller engine, which is going to serve as our main engine for our smaller stages on this brand new project. Because our only goal now is to land on the mud. And for this, we're going to need something much beefier than our current strata launch. So this isn't really designed to be an SSTO or an SSRT. This is designed to fling a around 13 ton payload up into space where it can complete its journey to orbit on its own. Unfortunately, the very first versions of it had a little bit of a problem. Luckily, that was just a problem with the landing gear as opposed to the uh, center of mass, and it was easily fixed. So think of this like a cross between a first stage of a rocket, a booster stage of a rocket, and an SSDO, because that's kind of what it is. It's like a first stage, but make it an airplane. And these first tests did exactly what it needed them to do. It flung this payload well out of the atmosphere, where if it would have had like a Terrier engine, it would have had no problem getting itself to orbit. So we did increase the size of the vertical stabilizers because it had a little bit of a wobbliness to it in the yaw axis, but we start working on the payload. And we've got 13 tons to work with, we ended up not using nearly as much as So we started out with a basic terrier stage and then added these little uh, janky stages with the uh, monopropel engine that we unlocked. Now they're not meant to be used like that and in retrospect, uh, using two monorepellent stages really wasn't a good idea because they drain from both stages because monorepellent doesn't obey crossfeed rules like normal fuel does for some reason. So we mounted the rocket on top of our brand new carrier aircraft and gave them both a very nice paint job. We've got them out here on the runway and this is going to be our main attempt at landing on the mud. So we take off the runway very smoothly might I add because I'm using a flat stick finally in this part of the video. Uh, I got a brand new flat stick and it works great for KSB2. For some reason, you just can't bind the yaw axis, so those are still a little bit jittery. So uh, the ascent profile for this is basically like our strata launcher from before, except it doesn't get to nearly the same speed on those Weasley engines. Instead of pitching up and releasing our rocket immediately, we pitch up and we light our main rocket engine that's attached to the aircraft. And we have like 41 tons of fuel here, and uh, it, it's, it's an insane amount of fuel for this. And it turns out to be quite enough fuel for this. You'll see what I mean here in a moment. So we easily get out of the atmosphere and coast up to our periapsis and I'm like, well, we'll use the extra fuel to boost our orbit up a little bit more before we release our rocket. Surely this won't be an SSTO, will it? So at this point, I'm not paying attention to the apoapsis at all because I think it's just going to run out of fuel and coast back down to Kerbin. But uh, we were in orbit. This is an SSTO. Huh? So we did a quick relaunch of this since I now know what it's capable of and uh, got right back into orbit, no problem. I accidentally made an SSTO. I, I swear I did not mean to actually make one, but I made one, so there you have it. So now I release our little rocket payload, which now has way too much Delta V for the mission it's about to complete. And I decided to use the extra Delta V to straighten out its orbit a little bit because we did a very bad job of putting this in a equatorial orbit. So we go out to where we'd meet the Mon at and straighten it out. Then time warp until we finally get an encounter. So once we get an encounter, we have no problem getting down to the surface even with this first stage. Like this is still the first stage. This is supposed to just get us into orbit and get us a mine intercept. But here we are actually landing on the mun with it. And I figured since we have so much Delta V, there'll probably be future mun missions, right? So why not just touch and go? So we're gonna land on the mun until we get the mission complete and you just just haul ass, get out of there. Completely get out of there and save our craft from the mun surface. So we land it, kinda. Uh, I let it tip back up so we can uh, take the engines off. And I'm hoping that at this point, I'm like, is it actually gonna get the mission? And it does. So we take off immediately. So this was actually really fun to do. It got my, got my heart racing, despite not really being that intense, I guess. Just kind of fun to touch the mun and go. Felt like a speed run. So we ditch that first stage and go to our modern propellant stage, which has horrible control issues, and get ourselves back into mud orbit for storage. So we go back and collect our wonderful science points, and we got a heap of them, a hundred, and then we got 300 science points. 300 science points, that's crazy. And we get our brand new mission, which is a strange signal on the mud that we need. But before we do that, we're gonna go ahead and cash in this the lonely satellite mission, which is just, have a probe in space. We've got plenty of those. So there we go. Easy. And we're going to go ahead and land our SSTO. And I'm immediately glad that there's no Kerbals on board because 
uh, it went a little bit haywire. Um, so we try to land this softly, maybe. We've just got our back vertical stabilizers that are huge, but really no way to control this thing. And somehow, crashing into the ocean at 290 meters per second does nothing to this thing. And not only does it survive, but it goes on to do one of the most beautiful things I have ever witnessed in my Kerbal Space Program career. If that doesn't make you cry, I don't know what will. So we quickly go back to our stages in Mun Orbit, and we're going to complete that Mun Signal mission. Now, right about there's the Mun Signal, and it looks suspiciously close to where I remember the Mun Arch being. I wonder if there's any connection between those two. So we're going to use our mono propellant stage here, which turns out to be our only mono propellant stage. And as we're doing that, I see it. There's a gaping hole in the ground where the signal is coming from. So I get a little bit closer to see if this is indeed where the monarch is. And as we get closer, we see, yeah, this is the monarch. It just has a giant hole under it. So of course, naturally, I'm going to go over and investigate it. But this is a little bit of a wonky probe to control since those engines were not made to be mounted in the middle. So uh, we did actually land here. Um, not in this, obviously. I mean, I guess you could call this a landing. We have litho brake, but we do actually land it here to see if we complete the mission. But we did not complete the mission for whatever reason. But we decided to do a whole new mission of our own. Go into the mun hole. So the mun arch is completely... Everyone's seen the mun arch, but... The mun hole is new, so what's at the bottom of this? It already looks like it's deeper than the mun hole. It's in a weird location. This is not on the pole of the planet. And uh, we're just going to send our little probe down into here and see what happens. So as we get lower and lower, our speed on our craft gets higher and higher. And I quickly realize that if this doesn't have a bottom, we're just going to go straight through the core of the mun. Now, if you've ever seen any videos of people going through the core of a planet, you know what happens. So right around here, we go through this weird string universe of textures of ground materials, but none of them really have collision. And then we see this exploded view of the hole, this outer view, out of bounds view of the hole. And we're currently deep inside of the mun, like very, very far inside of the mun at this point. And we just keep increasing in velocity. We, we keep gaining more and more speed. And around here it starts getting an insane amount of speed. Like this starts getting speed really quickly. And you see how deep we are inside of the Mun. And more and more speed. Quicker and quicker. Until finally we pass the singularity inside of the Mun. Speeding out of the other side. We're going so fast. That this is not even sped up past like three times. It's like six times speed I think. And here you'll see a shot in a second that's at real time speed and you can discernibly see us moving away from the mun. We're going 20,000 meters per second away from the mun. I think more is actually possible, but we just, we just went through a black hole here. We just went through a singularity at the core of the mun, which was about exactly last on my list of things to expect during this playthrough, an aircraft only playthrough. Who would have knew? But I'm afraid we'll have to end this episode right here, and I'd like to thank absolutely every person who has watched this series. This has been the most overwhelming support for something on my channel I've ever gotten, and I, I, I'm going to keep putting these out as long as you guys keep watching them, so stay tuned. On the left side of your screen, you'll see screenshots sent in by viewers just like you, and on the right side of the screen, you'll see either the previous or the next episode, depending on when you're watching. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm out.